Um, so I'm excited today to talk about um, the ACRL framework for information literacy, and I know um, it's been around for um, and kind of on our radar radars now for maybe close to two years. However, um, I know for myself and for others that I'm talking to all across the country, everyone is still trying to is grappling with it a little bit, is trying to figure out how it works in their particular practice, and um, how it'll work for them and how they can use it to their benefit at their particular institution or just their particular teaching um, interactions. So I hope today to provide a framework that um, I've found successful here with some of the projects I've been working on at Madison and um, how I've been able to use the frames within instructional design in order to both um, create really engaging learning for our students but also to uh, use it as a communication mechanism with others on campus as far as what impact and what value the libraries have to the teaching and learning enterprise for the university. So to the to-do list today, I'm going to talk about, or we have kind of four things on the agenda. The first one is I'm just going to take a little time to talk about the framework. Um, as Andy said, uh, I'm on the ACRL Student Learning and Information Literacy Framework Group, and uh, I'm um, leading up that subgroup this year. But I think as much as I've been entrenched in this for the last couple of years, I also am learning with everybody else about um, the framework and how it can work. And so I thought it would be useful for us to just to take a little time and talk about the framework and where it comes from and its roots to kind of ground some of the rest of the conversation. Then we'll talk a little bit about enduring ideas as part of a backward design process in which that um, curriculum can be designed for instructional purposes and um, how the framework fits in that. Um, we'll have a couple opportunities for interactivity. I know this is a webinar, but I'm an instruction librarian. I know many of you are too, and so there'll be a couple engagement activities during this webinar, and I hope you'll participate and try some of the strategies out today. And then lastly, I hope to leave at least 10 minutes, 10 to 15 minutes, for us to have a discussion about um, challenges you're having with the framework, questions you might for, have for me or for others in uh, the chat room today, or um, just successes that you're finding at your particular institution. Like I said, I think we're all working with this right now, and um, hearing what everybody is doing I think is really beneficial and fruitful to inspire our own design. So to start out with, I want to talk a little bit about the framework and kind of the pedagogy underneath it. So as um, most of you all know, I believe that um, the framework was kind of built upon this idea of frames, which is built upon the pedagogy of something called threshold concepts. So um, on the screen right now, I'm including uh, a quote about where threshold concepts first started. So the idea of threshold concepts emerged from the UK National Research Project on the possible characteristics of strong teaching and learning environments in the disciplines. In pursuing this research, um, the two people that were kind of credited for starting it um, found that certain concepts were held by economists to be central to the mastery of their subject. These concepts, the two people found, could be described as threshold ones because they have certain features in common. And I. Um, I thought this was really useful because I think, um, you know, we've had information literacy standards for years and years and years, and as we move to these threshold concepts, I think we all can agree that um, even when looking at standards, there's kind of um, in information literacy and library research and research life cycles, there are um, thresholds that students need to overcome to become um, experts in information literacy or on the expert spectrum. The next um, quote that I just wanted to pull out that's been really useful for me to figuring out how threshold concepts can work in practice is from a, a book called Engaging Ideas by John Bean. And I'm sure many of you know about this book, but if you haven't, I highly suggest including this in your library. I know we have a ebook copy um, at our library, but I also keep a, in a paper one as well. I use this book a lot when working with new faculty. Um, 
to teach them about designing research assignments, engaging students, and um, I know our writing center uses this book quite a bit in doing the same thing. And um, so when I work with new faculty and the threshold concept kind of phraseology was coming out through ACRL, um, I was really struck by this line that's in this particular book that I surmise that students cross a threshold from outside to inside. They also crush a threshold from superficial learning to motivated by grades to deep learning motivated by engagement with a question. Their transformation obtains an awakening even, perhaps a falling in love. Well, I think that's a little idealistic about the falling in love with information literacy. I think this is another um, quote that really talks about the utility of threshold concepts and um, how we can use them in our particular practice. So um, also in this Bean Book Engaging Ideas, um, he talks a lot about an expertise spectrum. And this is something that I talk about with new faculty all the time too. And I think it's something that um, even I need to be reminded of once in a while is um, I think you know when we read all of the information literacy threshold concepts or frames, that um, we are expecting to have students be kind of experts by the time they end our 50-minute session. And I think, you know, those of us that teach quite a bit, we know that's just not realistic. And when we look at the frames, we're, we're um, a little overwhelmed by how are we going to make sure that our students know all of this. And so in this Bean book, um, he talks about markers for insider pros. So how do we know that students are um, true experts in the, uh, a particular subject? So how do we know if students are true experts in um, writing in um, their particular discipline? And the markers are you know, knowledge in subject matter, knowledge in writing processes, knowledge in rhetorical um, expertise, knowledge in discourse in the community, and knowledge in the genre also included this is knowledge of the materials and information literacy concepts. And so included in this framework is um, really an information literacy knowledge of the threshold concepts. And so I think, um, I think it's important for all of us to think about um, where on that particular spectrum we see a particular class. So if it's a 100 level class, do we are expecting students to get through that threshold? Or are we just trying to get them a step towards the doorway of that threshold? Um, if it's a 400 level um, class, where do they fall? Are, are we getting them through that threshold? Or are we just kind of getting them still close? Because I think really, you know, when I'm talking to new faculty, you know, these markers of insider pros, to really become an expert, we're talking about graduate level work, in my experience. And so I know many of us that are working with undergraduate level folks or lifelong learners, um, I think sometimes it can be a little um, daunting to look at the framework and the frames and think about um, and feel like I need to get my students through the threshold of all six of those. So um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about that so that um, we could really feel empowered that it's not um, maybe achievable in a 15-minute section that we're going to accomplish the whole framework for information literacy. Um, so the frames have um, six markers or six frames of um, that are core, complex set of interconnected core concepts. Um, so these are broad learning goals that we hope to see our students um, meet at some point. And um, like I said, talking about where that student is on a, a, a spectrum of learning, um, I really believe that these are goals that students are achieved over an academic career. So I, again, I don't think it's realistic for our freshmen to walk through the threshold of all six of these frames. However, I do think it's achievable to move towards the threshold um, in a particular class that we're working with or pick a, one of the six thresholds or two of the six thresholds to move towards, um, depending on the context and the faculty member's needs and the student's particular needs. Also, the threshold concepts and the frames are really a holistic approach 
unlike the checklist approach of the old uh, sta information literacy standards. And I'm just noticing a lot in higher education overall, this move to holistic um, from checklist is really trending. I think it's an approach that is really connecting with um, the trends of looking at lifelong learning, knowing that learning doesn't happen the day that students graduate or get a certificate from our institutions, and also um, the goals that we all have in liberal education. And even when I talk to um, people in our technology department, they're thinking about these kind of holistic versus checklist um, methodology and when they're learning because things are moving so quickly. So uh, having a broad framework to focus our work I think is really behooves us in that when we look at the old standards, some of that language is really outdated and some of the practices just don't work for the information landscape today. So I think there's some um, freedom in having these frames that are a little more broad and holistic that really connect into the lifelong learning and the bigger objectives that we all have at our institutions, no matter what size. So that's a lot of pedagogy and kind of overview of the threshold concept. So um, how do we put that in practice? <coughs> Excuse me. So the, one of the um, most fruitful ways that I've found um, in using the frames for my instructional design has been using the backward design practice. Um, and I, many of you might know backward design, but I know um, to some folks this might be newer or uh, have used specific parts of this. And so this comes from uh, Higgins and Tide Understanding Design, and it's really using uh, a design methodology in which the goals or the outcomes of what you want from the student start the process, and then evidence indicators come next before you even start to think about instructional activities. So I think for us in library um, land, we often get requests from faculty that are, I want you to show them JSTOR, academic search, and a little bit of Google Scholar, and if you could talk about scholarly articles, that would be great. And so right away we get into like database demo land because that's what the faculty member asked for. So I think using backward design can really help us really um, talk about our learning goals and then talk about um, how we know students are gonna achieve that and then what we'll do and so we're not starting with what we'll do. Um, and so that we're making sure that we're really having um, an intentional design and an intentional um, flow for our instruction. And we'll talk more about this um, in the coming uh, uh, 45 minutes. So before, um, Andy in my introduction talked about a uh, a sift and winnow project that we worked on um, where we made a new online learning um, platform here at Madison and um, you know I was really I knew about instructional design uh, backward design and um, I had used it quite a bit and um, when we went with our instructional technologists um, just excuse me for a second Sorry, y'all. I have a shared office, so <laughs> I was just trying to get people to settle down so we could hear. All right. So um, when I was working on this pro practice or uh, this project, we worked with um, instruction designers at our Do It Academic Technology Unit, and um, a new concept to a uh, backward design that they brought into the process for us was this concept of enduring ideas. Um, and Enduring Ideas does come from backward design. It's um, kind of the part of thinking about what your essential questions and concepts are with designing curriculum. So at Wisconsin, we call these Enduring Ideas. At Ohio, um, Craig Gibson, that was part of the framework team that I've talked to, talks about these as general understanding ideas. But the gist of it is, is thinking about, before you even talk about learning outcomes, before you even talk about like what you, you, you um, specifically want to have students do. Thinking about what do you want your students to know about um, and remember 
from your library session or even a reference transaction if um, for those of you that might not be teaching on this um, particular webinar. So from the library instruction session, if you had a student in your class and they came back five years from now, what would you want them to remember from your session? So just think about that for a second. And in the chat box, think about maybe a class that you just worked with or a department you worked with or a program maybe you even worked with or even a reference transaction if you don't teach. And go ahead and share with us all, this is a group activity that I hope you participate in, what is one enduring idea? What's one thing that you want a student to come back and remember from that interaction five years from now? And why don't you, we'll take three or four minutes for everybody to enter something into the chat box. All right, we have a good number in here, but let's have a couple more. Let's take one more minute. If you have another one, go ahead and put it in. All right. <coughs> so I hope th that you all take some time and just look at um, some of the ideas that f folks have in here. And I think um, if you're like us, um, before we, we kind of went into the process when we were working on this new online learning project, um, with the instructional designers like already having our learning outcomes and they told us, you know, wait, 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 take a minute and think about like the big overall holistic goals for your particular um, project, um, what you want students to come out with. And when we really s took a step back and thought about five years from now, those big broad goals we want students to remember five years from now, a lot of, surprisingly and um, continuously with other projects I've been working on, a lot of that language starts to look very similar to the frames from the um, ACRL framework. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of things about librarians are there to help, but there's a lot of um, comments in here about um, research as inquiry or um, a little bit of scholarly communication, <coughs> um, how um, searching a strategic exploration, um, and just value statements of um, libraries in general. Um, so for us, we found that really helpful as a practice because um, as part of the instructional design process, 
for backward design, the first step um, after looking at um, the enduring ideas, which our instructional designers had really pushed for us to do, is to look at our learning outcomes and what your learners will be able to do. So this is getting a little more granular than those enduring ideas. So um, while a learning outcome might be how students can evaluate search results by the following indicators, and we, we all do this, relevance, currency, and authority, um, a big a bigger enduring idea might be that students realize that research is um, inquiry and that you have to evaluate um, information and not everything out there um, might be useful given your context. Um, and so the first step for us um, in the traditional backward design is to look at the learning outcomes. So what our learners will be able to do. So um, I'm picking out just one part as a sample through um, this backward design process of our online um, tutorial that we worked with. So for example, one of our learning outcomes were uh, students will be able to evaluate search results by the following indicators. And this um, will be able to is pretty standard practice from those that write learning outcomes. Um, those that follow Deb Gilchrist will um, know this kind of methodology quite quite well. And I think for us during this project, during, for any project that I'm working on backward design, I think the hardest part always is how to write good learning outcomes. And so I really rely on you know, like the image searches of Bloom's taxonomy because I think it really helps me think about like where on that spectrum of expertise that we talked about before at the beginning about why threshold concepts, where I expect these students to know um, and be able to um, conduct in the Bloom's taxonomy. So am I really just wanting them to know something um, or am I really expecting them to, um, I don't know, apply it in a particular library session? Um, and so whenever I'm writing learning outcomes, I have something like this up for folks to, um, for, for myself to look at and review to make sure that I'm not shooting too high on that spectrum for the particular student, student audience that I have. So let's take um, maybe another four minutes and have a group activity. And in the chat box, share or brainstorm a more specific learning outcome for the same class that you were just thinking about or same department or program you were just thinking about that you had or you would want to have. Um, related to your library session. And I'll go back to that Bloom's taxonomy in just a second, but so just share a learning outcome. So students will be able to something based on what you just, uh, that same group that you listed an enduring idea for.
All right, let's take one more minute for anybody that wants to share a learning outcome in the chat. All right, thanks for doing that, and we'll come back to um, that in a minute. So the next step um, in the backward design process, before we get to activities again, is to think about the assessment. So what are our evidence indicators that we know our students, we will know that our students achieve the outcomes? So what evidence will I see or analyze or um, hear about? that our learners have um, achieved those particular outcomes. <coughs> so um, I think I'm just going to take a pause here to talk about why I um, really think that backward design is very useful when um, using the ACRL framework for information literacy. I think one of the things that I've heard about um, or one of the concerns that I've heard about with the framework from folks is and that I had too very early on was um, that the framework is more of a holistic list of thresholds that we want students to cross over to to say that you know they are information literate um, in our particular discipline disciplinary context and um, I think that's really hard for us to be able to say, you know, in a you know, 100 level class or a freshman or first year students or even sophomores or seniors that, you know, we've got them through that threshold without um, having kind of evidence indicators. And so using the backward design process and talking about our enduring ideas and connecting to them to the frames then talking about our specific learning outcomes, and then making sure that we have assessment indicators allows us to still have accountability and um, assess our curriculum um, you know, for continual cycles of improvement and to assess over time, because I know a lot of us are beholden to accreditation or impact statements about what the library is doing for the, te mission, the teaching and learning mission of their university or college or school. And so this is why I think it's a really good idea for, um, you know, while I might not use backward design for every single instructional instance that I go through, but ones where I really want to um, make sure that I have a cycle of improvement or ones that are part of general education curriculums, for example, I really think there's a lot of utility in using this backward design process because of this assessment um, step in the middle where will have um, indicators about our success and our impact that we can use and call upon and have documented um, in the future um, for both our internal improvements but also for the needs of campus. So um, using my example of that before, the two um, kind of evidence indicators that we kind of outlined in our backward design process were identifying whether results are relevant to research questions and making a ju judgment based on those criteria appointments after reading results list. So I would really encourage everybody, I think, you know, sometimes we hear assessment and we hear capital A and we get a little scared. Um, I would really encourage um, everybody to think about assessment and to push ourselves to think about mixed methods, um, knowing that a lot of us are meeting students for 30 minutes to maybe an hour, we're not seeing them multiple times, just relying, knowing that our assessment is more formative than summative and that it's imperfect and that's okay. Um, I think, you know, talking about, and when I talk with my campus administrators about our um, assessment, the fact that we're doing it and that we can tell a story about how we're continually improving it with both campus administration and our faculty instructors, and um, that we're showing, um, having it part of our curriculum design process over time, um, makes those imperfections uh, less glaring than sometimes we feel when we think about, well, we're not in a classroom for 15 weeks with these students three times a week. Um, 
And so I think just embracing that and thinking about the different mixed methods and the opportunities that we do have within um, the time we do have with those particular students and thinking about um, what we do have afforded to us. And uh, if you want to learn a little bit more about this, there's a great book that I just kind of finished that um, as kind of a refresher to myself that ACRL published called Classroom Assessment Techniques for Librarians. Um, it's very short but has a lot of practical examples of how mixed methods assessments can be used um, in library instruction to uh, a really positive way. The next step and the step that um, backward design is really neat to is that this learning activities come part comes very last. Um, so the way that um, we have framed learning activities is by this read, read view, do kind of um, organization. So what will our students read, what will our students view, and what will our students do during our library instruction um, to achieve those particular outcomes. So I'm just including here, carrying through my examples, what our students read, view, and do based on the learning outcome. Um, of evaluating search results. And I think um, there's a major affordance here in having, uh, laying this out this way is because again, um, I think we have a, at least I have a propensity to want a database demo right away, especially if that's kind of the directive that you're getting from the faculty member. But I think laying it out even in a table format like this, um, sometimes this can help me um, you know, even subconsciously push beyond that a little bit to try to have different kinds of methods of instruction in my particular classroom. And while there not, might not be something in each column every single time, um, it's something that I'm cognitively thinking about and um, pushing myself to think about. Is there um, different kind of learning uh, methodologies that I can utilize to um, engage the students within this particular learning outcome. So I think this is where like the fun creative part comes um, in backward design for a lot of us, but it really does allow us to make sure that we're mapping out um, for all of the different um, reasons why we're doing the session. So this is a course map um, where in a table format um, I've listed out the, uh, our learning outcome, the enduring idea, and depending on, um, uh, sometimes after looking at the learning outcomes, you realize that there's not an enduring idea that's matched to it, and it does sometimes help you prioritize if you really want to work on that learning outcome or if you want to change your learning outcome. Our evidence and assessment indicators, and then our student activities about what they'll read, view, and do. So I think there's major um, affordances to making a course map like this. And in a particular library instruction session, there might be um, three or four rows in your particular course map. So this is just one that I've brought up for this particular presentation. In our real course map, I think we have five or six rows um, for a blended module. But this is one row for us to have to organize our curriculum, number one to um, really improve our efficiency over time. So I think, um, you know, I am completely guilty of this where I do a, a one-off session for somebody and then next year or two years later, the class wants me to do a session again and I've lost my notes and I, I'm reinventing the wheel. So having a course map that I'm saving can be really efficient in that I can go back and see what I've done in the past, or if I need to have a colleague teach the class for me, they can see the general um, curriculum map or course layout or course design um, and not have to reinvent that wheel from scratch. Also, the third affordance that I really find from this process is um, the communication piece. So for us, for this particular project, this um, online tutorial that we're using, that I'm using examples from today, I can then use this course map as a communication piece with faculty and instructors about what are the outcomes from a particular session, what are the lifelong learning goals from a particular session, what evidence are we collecting from the particular session that students are meeting this that maybe we could collaborate on, or 
um, maybe the instructor would benefit from seeing as well to um, meet their particular um, learning outcomes for the whole class. And then exactly what we are having students um, do in the session. And so, um, for example, we use uh, for this um, online project that we've tutorial been working with, we um, tweak the course map every um, year based on the assessment that we're seeing and feedback we're getting from faculty and focus groups with students. And we document each year the iteration of this course map. So we're showing how we're making improvements over time and how we're um, affecting our student learning and what assessment indicators that we have over time, which is something that um, is pretty unique and that our assessment folks um, for at the campus level are really excited about because um, I think you know libraries and research are synonymous and so often um, campus administrators want to talk about how um, we're helping students in the research and having this kind of assessment data um, from the libraries sometimes is not readily available or just isn't existing on campus from any place. And so the fact that um, we are doing this now and having it kind of laid out over a timeline, um, they're very excited about for accreditation purposes, but also very excited about as we have discussions about um, gen ed and other courses in which they um, information literacy is a key component. Um, so, uh, like Andy said, I'm on the ACRL Student Learning Information Literacy Committee, and this is just one example of how um, I've used the frames in my instructional design. There's a lot of examples of how others across the country are starting to grapple with and use um, the frames in their instructional design too. <coughs> and so coming soon-ish, there'll be a sandbox offered um, by ACRL where people will be including um, course materials related to the ACRL framework for others to use, view, adapt. And so I think that's a really um, exciting next step that's coming for the ACRL framework so that um, while you know, I've had this one model that I've shared with you all today, there's other models out there of what people are doing inspired by the framework, and I'm really excited to see um, how that goes um, as soon as that becomes live, because I think there's a lot that we can learn from each other, and I think I always feel like I'm still learning um, you know, about how threshold concepts are, are going to work and how um, I can have discussions with um, faculty and other student support units on campus. And so I think sharing with all with each other is going to be really important during um, this new generation of information literacy and how it's um, interwoven into curriculums. So um, as promised, we have about 15 minute, more minutes for questions, discussions. I really like to take this time. If you have questions specific for me about this process, um, you know, webinars are always a little awkward because I'm not be able to see like where people have questions or um, things that you might still be grappling with or something that was not clear. Questions for me, great. Um, experiences you all are having with using the framework or with backward design, I'd love to hear. Um, challenges, I think uh, we'd all benefit from challenges or even failures. Um, I think sometimes we try to hide those under a bushel, but I think a lot of learning comes from failures. And I, I just want to remind, we're all learning this together. It's, it's brand new um, within the organization. And so um, I'd just like to open it up for discussion now. I have attempted to unmute um, everybody. You might get a request to unmute yourself, but please feel free to either use voice or chat. So maybe I'll start with the one on the bottom here from Kate. So she's asking about, do you recommend creating course maps instead of outlines? Um, so I would say that they're different things. So a course map lays out the, the curriculum design. But we still, um, so for this particular class that we're use, that I used the sample from today, we still have an outline of like what we're going to do in the classroom when we get there. 
Um, and so, you know, if you're having a, camp, a search or, you know, prompt questions, like that doesn't really fit in the curriculum map. The curriculum map is really lot, laying out like why you're doing it, what you're going to do, an activity. Um, I think you could probably have a course map and then like, you know, depending on your style, some people like really robust outlines and some people like very short. I'm usually like a three-liner for my, you know, three bullets for my particular outlines when I teach. Um, and having that underneath, but I think that they're two distinct things. One's the actual curriculum design and one's the kind of um, outline of what you're going to do and how you're going to do it in the session, your script, if um, lack for, for a better word, even though um, usually we're not scripting everything out. Let me know if that doesn't make sense to you. Does anybody have any other questions for Sheila? I'd love to know in the chat if anybody um, has used the, fr the framework or frames or part of it um, to influence your teaching yet. And it could be just a quick yes, no in the poll, um, as a poll in the chat. So, so those of you that are saying yes, um, would you be willing to share how you're using it? I know those of you in the chat might not be. It's, it's, um, Sure, this is Kate Kensky from uh, UW-Milwaukee, yeah. and I'll chime in and then briefly and let others chime in as well. Uh, so here, primarily, we're using it to um, take our instruction to the into the higher order thinking, getting into some of the more um, troublesome um, critical thinking elements of information literacy um, and looking for ways to push beyond um, <coughs> what we might think of more of the standards or um, basic how-to um, and into more of the, the thought processes. Great. So Jenny, I see you have a question about um, how are we working with faculty to assess our sessions? Um, and I think that differs from session to session. And so that's why um, I really talked about, you know, really needing to push ourselves and um, embracing that, you know, much of our assessment is formative. Um, in the sample that I'm using today, um, we're working with faculty um, as we um, surf survey the cohort of faculty that teach our communication aid course every spring semester just to talk about, um, to check in with them about our learning outcomes and seeing where our students are still grappling or where they're seeing um, deficiencies in their particular assignment. But then to couple with that, we're doing assessment in the library class session so that we can check in on the validity of what the anecdotal evidence from the faculty we're seeing. So a good example of this is um, we hear from faculty quite a bit that our students are really having trouble finding a scholar or uh, evaluating and finding a scholarly article. But in the library session from our um, quiz data that we have via Qualtrics or you could do it during with SurveyMonkey and anecdotally with working with students, um, we're seeing that students are able to find a scholarly article. And so there's a, a mismatch there with, and I, I, I'm starting to see that the students are able to find one, but they are having more trouble finding one that might meet, meet their topic or because the assignment is saying you have to have a scholarly article, otherwise you'll be docked a letter grade. It's so binary that they want to make sure they're checking so they don't lose points. And so I think having 
that's where I, I'm really a big advocate of mixed methods and getting um, both sides of the story, so the librarian's anecdotal side of the story, getting um, the student side of the story, and getting the instructor's perceptions are really um, interesting and useful just because I think sometimes those can conflict and we want to make sure that we're making changes to our curriculum um, based on what's the, the whole picture and not one person's picture um, given there's different um, uh, persona characters in the room. <coughs> I'd love Jenny um, Kailas to talk a little bit more about how she's incorporating metacognition into their assignments. That sounds really great. It looks like Kate would want that too. <laughs> So for those of you on the chat, are there any um, that are trying this or those of you that haven't yet, um, what's stopping you or um, what are the challenges that you're facing trying to use the um, frames in your instructional um, contexts? Oh yeah, sure, Kate. So um, my question was, uh, what are struggles or challenges that are, folks are having um, using the um, frames in their instruction? If you are, I mean, for me, the person, the first struggle was like really understanding what a threshold concept meant and how I was going to use it. Um, but I, there's other struggles I definitely have. So um, I'd love to hear from others that might be having struggles. Thanks, Jenny, for sharing that. Um, I think that's really interesting, especially um, in the online ca context where personalized learning is so important for the learning process. Um, and so the fact that you recommend it, kind of taking um, reference to the max and incorporating it into your instructional practice for online and really making it into a personal learning strategy is really interesting. It's cool. Thank you for sharing. Yes, yeah, Jen, so reading Jenny's comment again about time consuming, so that was my next question for you was scale, um, but I know scale is not everything too, and uh, for particular classes, um, I'm sure it's very valuable. Anna, that's a really good point about, um, you know, time is precious in our classrooms, especially when we have, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> we have about an hour with these students to kind of um, help them through their curriculum. Um, so, uh, like I said, um, you know, 
I think we're prone to wanting to do, um, not all of us, but I know I am, to, to you know, want to do database demo. And so um, one strategy that we've started to use here with one particular class is um, instead of using our own topics that we've already canned, um, having students come up or give walk us through the searching that they've already done on their particular topic. And um, I think it's, we've gotten fabulous feedback from it, from the students and the faculty, because it's more authentic to their particular place. And it's more authentic to show the messiness of research. Um, this, I think, where we can show, move even a little closer to some of these um, threshold concepts like um, searching a strategic exploration. It's not a linear process, and it's not often an easy process. And so letting the students have a voice in that, um, we kind of let them drive the show, knowing that um, it might result in a, a messier discussion um, and a little, uh, you know, a, a can search. We know what's going to come up and um, we're comfortable with that and so kind of puts us on our, our heels a little bit more and on our toes a little bit more with the students. But we found um, that to be really fruitful. Um, and I know a lot of us have trouble with students getting up and wanting to offer their topic or go through the searches they've had and their, and their struggles. But we have one librarian here that's fabulous at it, and she's just like, somebody give me a topic and I'll, make you, I'll help you with your research and I'll make you look really good in front of your instructor. And um, she has a lot of success getting people in the front of the room to do that kind of thing. Yeah, so Jenny, it sounds like you're having similar experiences. So we have about um, five more minutes. Does anybody have any last minute questions or comments? All right. I hope this was useful um, to you all. I'm happy to continue a conversation or chat with anybody um, that wants to try this out or is working on something. Um, I'd love to hear if anybody has any major success stories, so um, I'll just leave that out there, that if you want to get in contact and talk about it, or um, if you try a course map for the first time and want just another pair of eyes, I'd be happy to um, be a peer colleague that particular way. Um, and I hope this was useful to, to folks today. Um, if you have any particular feedback about today's session, um, um, Go ahead and put it in the chat. Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Sheila, if you could, would you kindly put um, your contact information that you would prefer people use in the chat, and then I'll send out the chat logs with the, with the recording. Um, so thank you, everybody, for attending. And a big thank you to Sheila, despite that cold. We hope you're feeling better, that you share your time and your knowledge and experience with us. Again, I'll be sending out the recording from today's meeting. And I hope everybody has a great day. Thank you. <laughs> You're fine now. You're good.